had kind of a tough week. And uh, I really appreciate so many of you calling and praying and you know asking about me and asking about my mom. And I really appreciate that. So thank you for your love. I, I felt love this, this week, even though I was a little bit exhausted. But I'm in better shape than my mom is. So uh, just keep praying for my mom. Her name's Claire. I'd like to pray for my mom. So I heard a question. OK. Interesting title of the sermon this week. How many of you feel like jumping for joy? Did you have such a good week that you just can't contain it and you just have to jump up and down? Have you ever been that happy? <laughs> Not in a while. Uh, Cheryl and I watched, uh, late last night, we watched the women's final of the U.S. Open Tennis Championship, and it was two Italian women playing, and they have been friends since they were 9 and 10 years old. And they're now 32 and 33 years old. So they've been friends a long time. And they started playing together and playing against each other when they were 9 and 10 years old over in Italy. And, and they went to tennis camps when they were kids. And they enjoyed all that growing up together. And so now they're playing each other in the U.S. Open. And I think this is the first time I've ever seen this in all my life. After it's done and there's a winner, the champion, and the loser, second place, right? Both of them were so happy. I mean, they were both happy. Uh, when they were being interviewed, they were hugging each other and smiling like they both won. How amazing is that, to be that happy when you've come in second? Because you're happy for your friend, and you're celebrating her victory, even though she just beat you. And I thought, you know what, that's, that's really what it's supposed to be like in the church when we have the joy of Christ, we have the joy of the Holy Spirit, that... Yes, there's times and days that we lose, right? And, and there's days that we win. There's victories. Uh, you, you get a, a job promotion or you get a job or you, you get a pay raise or something good that happens, right? Uh, those are all things to celebrate. The birthday of a child, uh, a graduation of a child, amen? All these are milestones and things to celebrate. How about celebrating something like a wedding? Just had a year anniversary for somebody here recently. And uh, still smiling. Awesome. Uh, all these things are things that we celebrate. And we can even celebrate together. Amen. But when was the last time you personally jumped up and down for joy? I, I think we're a little bit too inhibited. I think we need to loosen up a little bit and be more like children. Didn't Jesus tell us that unless we come to him like little children, we can't enter the kingdom of God? I think part of that, I don't think I fully understand what it means to have faith like a child, but I think part of it is having that unreserved joy. When a child's happy, you know it. They get so excited. I still love the, the little video that Carolyn Kwan sent me when she brought home a box of used tennis balls. Now, do you ever get excited about getting used anything? Used has a box of used tennis balls. She brought these home, and her little boy Michael opened that box up, and she, she was taking video of this, and he acted like he just won the lottery. I mean, he's like, oh, oh. He was so excited. He just he was jumping up and down in place. He couldn't stop it. And I think that's kind of a good example for us, jumping up and down for joy in Christ. And this should not be abnormal. This should be normal. Even when we experience difficulties, when Peter was arrested and thrown in jail and beaten for preaching the gospel in the temple he counted it all joy and when he was released and he got back together with the disciples they all rejoiced now how many of you enjoy getting a beating anybody I don't think they rejoiced about getting a beating I think they rejoiced that they had been counted worthy to follow Jesus. They rejoiced in following Jesus. They rejoiced 
and being counted worthy, they rejoiced in Peter being released. I mean, they had a lot of joy, and they did not contain it quietly in a somber worship service. I think we've brainwashed ourselves to not be very good followers of Jesus. Jesus was a happy guy. He didn't go around with a frown on his face. As a matter of fact, he was such a happy guy, the Pharisees attacked him by saying, you're a friend of sinners. You, you party with party animals. And you're, Jesus is like, yeah, so? The joy of the Lord is my strength? How about you? If you were living your faith with joy, do you think you could stop people from following Jesus? I think people in this world are a little hungry for joy. What do you think? And there's a thousand counterfeit joys out there that are circumstantial and short-lived. And here's what we find about, and neurologists know this, psychologists know this, all the stuff that supposedly makes us happy, not joyful, happy, is so transitory and it actually comes with added stress and it exhausts us. Let's go use one little example. How about a new car? Anybody here like getting a new car? Okay, cool, right? Yeah. Let's say everybody get a new car. Maybe we can be like the Oprah show and give everybody a brand new car, right? Wouldn't that be cool? You came on the right Sunday, yes. <laughs> but let me tell you what happened to my Aunt Kathy, my mom's sister. She lives in Napa. She bought a new car. Drove it home, had it not even a week, had 300 miles on our brand new car. And you know what happened? That little thing called the Napa earthquake. And so all the stuff that was on the shelves in her garage fell on top of her brand new car and just smashed and dented and, and broke the glass of her brand new car. Every time you get a new car, you know what you get? More maintenance, more insurance, and it will always need. Don't you know this? Isn't this true? If I'm telling you the truth, say amen when I'm through with this. It's going to need oil changes. It's going to need brakes. It's going to need maintenance. It's going to need new tires. It's going to need all this stuff on a regular basis. Amen. Is that stuff cheap? A little bit of stress there? Why do we celebrate stuff like that? Why don't we find our joy in Christ? Because that is unshakable, unbreakable, eternal, free of charge, untaxable. You know what I'm saying? There's a little more joy in Jesus than there is in this world. How come we're so easily distracted by the so-called happy stuff of this world? I think that's going to have to be another message. Grace and shalom all come from joy. They're all members of one family. Joy, grace, and shalom. Joy and grace are two forms of the same word in the New Testament. Joy is the response to special favor from God. Shalom is the powerful rest he that comes when we know that everything is right. And all of you who are parents or grandparents, I want to give you a little example of shalom. It's night. The kids or grandkids are in bed sleeping. And you're standing in the doorway of their bedroom. And you're enjoying the silence. You're enjoying the, the smooth, even, soft breathing of your child or grandchild. And you feel nothing but joy and peace and wholeness and rest and all is right in the world. Is that a good feeling? You kind of wish you could bottle that and keep it, don't you? That's what God wants us to live in every minute of every day. His joy. His shalom. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at just a couple moments in the life of Mary and Elizabeth.
Mary just had the angel Gabriel tell her, you're going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know how much joy she felt in that moment, that exact moment. That might have freaked her out. Can we just say maybe, right? That might have freaked her out. But let's look at verses 39 to 40 in Luke chapter 1. Now, at this time, Mary arose. This is after the angel Gabriel left her. Now, at this time, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. They knew each other, their family, they're related. They've probably spent many years together. Look what happens in verse 41. And it came about that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, like, Hi, Elizabeth! The baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The baby John, in Elizabeth's womb, leaped for joy. I don't want to make any political statements at this time. I just want to recognize that a baby in the womb is a person created by God, known by God. And John leaped for joy. You know, not too many of us remember back to when we were babies. You know, I, I, how many of you have any memories at all when you were in diapers? Any man, anybody? Okay. Uh, it's not very common. It's even less common for us to remember when we're in the womb. But I think John must have remembered this because we have it in the Word of God. And look what Mary does next. I mean, they greet each other. Uh, they're so excited. They're so thrilled. In verse 44, For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Wow! What is Mary's response starting in verse 46? My soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time and for all generations will count me blessed. All generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. Mary had an intimate, loving relationship with her Lord. She was not simply a religious woman. She was not simply a spiritual person. There's a, a big article in Today's B about how more and more people are spiritual, not religious. I encourage you to read the article. Mary had a very profound, intimate, loving relationship with God. And God had this same intimate, loving relationship with Mary, and he had regard for his humble servant. To look upon and gaze upon her with special respect, verse 48. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. To have regard for means to look upon with care. If you're regarding something with this New Testament word, with this word from the Greek language, it means that you're intently observing. It's kind of like me and my sister beside my mom's bedside since Wednesday. We've been intensely observing her. How is her breathing? How is her color? And then, you know, there's all the monitors like, is her heart rhythm okay? You know, all these things. We're observing carefully. And then we've got lots of questions for the doctor because we've been observing carefully. And in life, Jesus has his eyes on us 24-7. You do realize God doesn't slumber or sleep. We do, thank God. But he doesn't. He all, he's always watching us. His eyes are always on us. He has regard for his humble servants. And then Mary says, for the mighty one has done Great things for me. Do you remember the great things God has done for you? If your joy tank is a little empty, 
You know, you, we all drive cars and we all have gas tanks that regularly need filling, correct? Unless, of course, you have the plug-in hybrid. Uh, there's a really smart guy in the back that has one of those cars. He never has a gas tank to fill up, but he does have a battery to charge. So if it's getting a little low on energy, if your gas tank's a little low on joy, what do you do to fill your gas tank? And I'm actually asking a question. <laughs> what do you do to fill your joy tank? Remember, throughout the Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament, we're instructed to remember the great things God has done. I have multiple prayer journals in my office for years and years and years, and I've written down for years and years and years the great things God has done in my life. And I've gotten the testimony of my own mother, and I know the great things God did in my life from the time I was in her womb. My mom was sick with rheumatic fever when she was pregnant with me. The doctors instructed her to get an abortion because I would be born with multiple birth defects. But here I am. All ten fingers and toes. I'm not saying everything's right between the ears, but everything else is here. God has worked in my life from the time I was conceived. God has done great things in my life. God is doing great things in my life. I have memories that I can pull up and rejoice in anytime I need to. And so do you. God does not love me more than he loves you. Amen? Oh, that was puny. I mean, I'm thinking some of you don't really believe God loves you. If you think God might love you, let's, hear, let's have a hearty amen to give God the glory for loving you. Amen? Amen. 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 Like I said, we, we need to practice being a little more rejoiceful around here. Uh, a little less quiet, a little more jumping up for joy. Amen? What are some of the mighty things God has done? Scattered the proud, brought down rulers in our lifetime. Our being, you know, the general... All of us in this room. Uh, anybody here remember a guy named Nixon? Yeah, some of you remember. Uh, God brought him down. Filled the hungry with good things. Our church blessed 29 families this week. There's 29 families less hungry now because of you, because of God's work in Southside. Praise God for that. God has rejected the rich. Now, being rich by itself is not cause for God to reject you. Abraham was rich. Job was rich. God did not reject them. But people that depend on their money instead of God, God does reject. God helped Israel. God has spoken to Abraham and his offspring. God has spoken. Rejoice that God is speaking to you. What did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. If you have faith in Jesus, you're one of his sheep. Praise God. He's your shepherd. You're secure. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand. There's all kinds of reasons to jump up in joy just for that fact alone. The great things God has done for you. So when you start building joy, you start building your jumping ability. Amen? Amen? Let's talk about a little of that. Building joy that jumps means that you take care to develop a tender heart toward weakness. Build a tender heart toward weakness. I will confess to you something I'm not proud of. Okay? You don't have to write this down because I'm not proud of it. But the fact is, in, in the spiritual gift tests that people give, I score almost zero on mercy. I score very high on all the teaching gifts and leadership and prophecy and all that stuff. I'm off the chart there. Really strong there. But when it comes to mercy, I've got a heart like the Grinch that stole Christmas. I'm like 10 sizes too small. And so one of my regular prayers, and I mean this, this is in my prayer journal, I pray for God to give me his heart for people, that I would love people just like Jesus does. And so when servants of God like Jeff come to me and ask me 
if I would help and help our church help hurting families in Sacramento, I thank God for answering my prayer. And at the same time, I realize I have so far to go. If you want to have joy in your life, you have to have a heart that wants to help the weak. And you don't have to be really strong to help the weak. Did you realize that? Jesus said he, he made it so simple for us if we simply give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. That's all it takes. It, it's not rocket science, is it? It's simple. So develop a tender heart toward weakness. And if your heart's like mine, just pray. Pray for God to help you love like he does. Amen? And then bless the hurting and the needy. Develop a tender heart. And part of the way we develop a tender heart is by actually blessing those who are hurting. If you see a homeless person, stop and talk with them. They're ignored by most people. A simple smile and a little conversation can do a world of good. Ask, and you, ask if you can pray for them. Ask if they've been in contact with their, any of their family. Maybe you could call someone for them. You know, it's not, they don't just need a hamburger from McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? They need another human being to take a minute and care for them. I'm not saying give them eight hours of your, of your, of your day, but give them a little of yourself, right? Care for the hurt. And this week, I want to give you a challenge. Read Isaiah 58. Take out your Bible. Sit quietly with your Lord and invite Jesus to speak to you his heart for people out of Isaiah 58. Amen? Now, here's the result of building holy joy. Shalom. And that's what God promises in Isaiah 58. When you do these things, he instructs us to do in Isaiah 58, you will have shalom. You'll have that perfect, peaceful rest and contentedness that you feel when you stand in the doorway of your child's room when they're sleeping at night. And all is right in the world. You know that feeling. Would you like a little more of that feeling? Could other people use a little more of that reality in their life? So develop a tender heart toward weakness. Bless the hurting by giving yourself. And then you'll experience God's shalom. You'll have joy that jumps. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus... All of us in this room need more of you. Lord, it doesn't matter how long we've known you or how many years we've attended worship services. Honestly, none of that matters unless we're following you for real. Unless we're actually trusting you and loving you and obeying you, simply sitting in a worship service does no good at all. So, Lord, help us to build your joy in our daily lifestyle. That our lifestyle would not be simply about me, but it would be about you. And then as we start loving you, as we start trusting you, as we start obeying you, and you and your love help our hearts become tender towards the weak and the hurting, and then you help us start stretching our hands out to bless them. Lord, you will give us your joy. You'll give us your shalom. And Lord, you'll give Sacramento your joy. You'll give Sacramento your shalom. Lord, we need you. We need your joy. So Lord, help us build your joy in our lives today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives on this planet. As you give us life, Lord, make us your people of joy that we would spread your joy with all people we know. 
May they count Southside Community Church as the, literally the most joyful place in Sacramento. That you would be glorified. Jesus, thank you for hearing this prayer. And thank you for however you're going to answer this prayer. We praise you and love you in your holy name. Amen. This concludes our service. So, you know what you get to do now? Jump for joy, folks! <laughs> Be happy. Go on the power of the Holy Spirit and live a joyful life. Amen?